Good day, Thomas Jefferson Hour podcast listeners. And as always, thank you so much for listening. This week, a very special show, primarily a discussion between you, Clay, and Professor Joseph Ellis about his book, American Sphinx. And this sort of represents the beginning of a series of conversations that you and Joe have planned. I'm so um, you know full of respect for Joseph Ellis and his work. I've read all of his books as they appeared. We became friends a long time ago, and he's been such a a blessing to the Thomas Jefferson Hour during this pandemic. And I hope this is a conversation, a series of conversations that just continues indefinitely. But I asked him a, a short time ago if we could go through his books more or less systematically and sort of debrief him about his, um, his, his career. And of course, he's the first to say it's not over yet. He still has more books in him. But he agreed. And so uh, this is the first of those conversations. It's about um, one of his sort of the middle of the of the pack books, um, American Sphinx, the character of Thomas Jefferson. And it's through that book uh, that I met him uh, in the studios of of the great documentary filmmaker Ken Burns. And so, you know, it's just it's a delight. He, you know, he he's rereading his books. Uh, some of which he hasn't read for many, many years. And I'm reading the books, which I've read before, but I, I, I reread American Sphinx, and, I'm, and I wish we'd had more time. But in this, in this uh, podcast, we talk about uh, the elusiveness of Jefferson's personality, his capacity to wall off different parts of his being so that they didn't have to talk to each other, which I, is, I think, the major insight of American Sphinx. And we talked about um, his radicalization during his time in France. So with that, let's go to the show. Before we do, anything that you want to update our listeners on, sir? Yeah, quickly. I just need to say there are still some places in the online homework course. I'm so excited about this. In fact, I'm looking at the uh, Mask of Agamemnon as we record this. So there's that. The, the, we've opened up another session in the winter retreat. So a second session on J. Robert Oppenheimer, the making of the atomic bomb and the decision to use the atomic bomb. So if people are interested in that four-day Humanities Retreat West of Missoula. Just go to jeffersonhour.com. And we just put up today, uh, David, the, uh, the Salmon River trip. So we're doing the Lewis and Clark trip next summer. It's already almost full. We're also going to do a, a five-day float trip on the Salmon River, the River of No Return that Lewis and Clark tried oh to float and couldn't. And so that's going to be a Lewis and Clark uh, journey, but it also involves John Muir, Edward Abbey, um, and uh, Aldo Leopold. So it's more about sort of the, the West and conservation and, and how, how the West um, so inspired people that we've agreed to set parts of it aside uh, for permanent protection, a subject of, as you know, great importance to us here in North Dakota with the Elkhorn Ranch of Theodore Roosevelt. So all those are coming, go to the Jefferson Hour site, but, but, but I'm really promoting at the moment, in addition to my book, Repairing Jefferson's America, um, is this uh, homework course, uh, online, five sessions, and people can find it if they simply go to, to jeffersonhour.com. None of that, of course, um, involves um, Joseph Ellis, but, um, but I have to say this conversation with him um, was really meaningful to me because, you know, you, you're listening to a, I don't think maybe people realize how senior and important a historian Joseph Ellis is and that he's giving us some of his time and his insights uh, is a gift that you, you you could never buy it. I mean, this is this is a gift that he's giving us and to our listeners, and I'm just thrilled uh, to to step back and listen to him. I'm, I feel so fortunate that that he is being so generous with his time and his insight and his knowledge. As always, if you want more information about um, all the things that Clay just updated us on, uh, go to jeffersonhour.com. You can find more details there, uh, find out how to sign up for these courses, etc. cetera. And, and I can say I made a, a very short guest appearance at the end of one of your Zoom classes, and it's obvious that all of the people involved have enjoyed themselves immensely, um, that it's a, it's, a, it's a great experience for them. So I would encourage people to go to jeffersonhour.com and find out more about that. And um, if you want to support the show. The reason that you are on the Zoom call is that people don't think you exist. Uh, people think that I, I'm a ventriloquist. And so I asked you to come on and to, and, to, and to make sure people understand that you're an actual human being. Yeah, I'm sure they were convinced. <laughs> and that the title, uh, you know, um, semi-permanent guest host of the Thomas Jefferson Hour is the actual uh, legal description of your work. Um, so I, I, I hope you will come on to more of these uh, these online courses because I think people 
they think, well, who is this mysterious uh, guest host? Oh, enough of that. Indeed. Let's go to the show. Good day, citizens, and welcome to this special edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, our weekly opportunity to discuss all things Jefferson and American history. I'm particularly looking forward to the conversation on the Jefferson Hour this week. I'm your host, David Swenson, and I'm joined by the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, the award-winning humanities scholar and author, Clay Jenkinson. And we are also joined by our returning champion and one of our favorite guests, Mr. Joseph Ellis. Mr. Ellis is an American historian whose work focuses on the lives and times of the founders of the United States. And this week, we're going to be discussing one of his earlier works from 1996. Gentlemen, welcome to you both. Oh, thank you very much. You know, I'm so eager to begin this conversation with uh, Joseph Ellis. Uh, we've been talking about it now for three or four months. Uh, we're going to look at the founding generation and, and, and implicitly, at least, use it as a window on where things are in the United States today, at least to ground the national conversation in the works of Joseph Ellis. You've written uh, a large number of books, and the one that I want to start with, if it's all right with you, uh, Joe, is uh, the book on Jefferson, American Sphinx, the character of Thomas Jefferson. Just just set the scene. Uh, you, I believe you wrote that just before the millennium. That's right. It was late 90s. Um, I had started when I was a graduate student at Yale thinking my dissertation was going to be uh, an analysis of Jefferson's character. And my then mentor, a guy called C. Van Woodward, said, no, 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 you can't do that. You're not ready for that. He's too big for you. Um, and biography requires you to be a bit older. You've got to see some life before you can see it as a whole. So put that on the back burner and do it later, but don't do it now. So that's what I did. Jefferson is the second most written about figure in American history. See if you can guess who's first, Clay. Uh, 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 Lincoln? Yes. <laughs> Lincoln. beats. He's the only one that beats Jefferson in terms of number of books. So that when you take him on, you better have something fresh to say or something you think is fresh. And I thought I did. And, and I started. It took me about four years to research it and write it. And it was successful. It, it won the National Book Award. And uh, it was a miracle that I won that award. And my wife told me not to write the book because I wasn't in love with Jefferson. In fact, I had some critical things to say about Jefferson and you got to love your subject in order to write about him. Well, I said, well, maybe I love him, but I wouldn't marry him. And, um, uh, and, um, she said, that sounds like me. And, uh, but anyway, when I won, the, when I won the national book award and stood up to accept it, she said, you shouldn't have written it. <laughs> Uh, it was a joke, and the crowd yelled and screamed. But anyway, I'm going on. But, yep, that's the context for the creation of the book. Just as long as we're on this subject, Joe, what is it when you win the National Book Award? There's a ceremony. What else? Yeah, it's like the, it's like the Oscars. Unlike the Pulitzer, where they send you a thing in the mail and says you won the Pulitzer, and then you go to a, a luncheon at Columbia and get a little paperweight thing and— um with the National Book Award, you've got to go to New York and participate in a two- or three-day thing where the finalists uh, meet and go to different libraries. And then there's a ceremony in a hotel where you have tables that each publisher buys, and you sit at your publisher's table, and and then they have the win, you know, in different categories, poetry, fiction, nonfiction, children's books. And the, the category nonfiction is a huge category because it's not just history, but it's biography and memoir and everything. And so it's hard to win in that category. And then they announce the winner and you go up and accept and deliver a little allegedly impromptu talk, which you prepared for 10 hours beforehand. So that, that book and that award uh, did another thing for you. It, it got the attention of Ken Burns and his producers, and you then became a consultant and an on-air talking head in Ken Burns' documentary on Jefferson, which is where I met you in Walpole, New Hampshire. That's true. You and I met 
up in his um, factory up there in New Hampshire where they produce the films he does. And um, he's got a ton of people working up there, as you know. And I think we, you know, we bonded there and I think we caused him a little trouble because we were We were hecklers. Yeah, we were heckling from behind. Not heckling him, but Uh, just heckling. They they showed us this, um, the takes on the projected documentary on this little screen. Remember that? And like, you're looking at this little screen and then they showed this, one slave that was a, one of the photographs that that Ken wanted to feature in the film, and it's a it's the view of a this of the back of a slave who's sitting there and it's totally scarred and everything. And um, there was a woman who was the curator at Monticello who said, "No, he can't show that because that's not a Monticello slave. That's a 19th century slave, and it's not really right. And you got to tell him." <laughs> so I said, yeah, you can't show that. That's a misrepresentation. And I remember Ken saying, poetic license. And he, it was in the film. Well, I remember that you and I were nearly tossed out of that studio. We were not heckling Ken Burns. We were just we were just making a running commentary on the talking heads, including yours and mine. But at any rate, th- we got to meet that way. And be- because we got to meet there, uh, we've gotten to know each other. And in the pandemic has really allowed us to nurture this this conversation between us and so i've been i reread american sphinx i read it when i came out i've read it two or three times since i will say this of the book that um my favorite book on jefferson is a biography it's merrill peterson's thomas jefferson and the new nation uh, which is a an outstanding one volume biography i've read of course dumas malone six volumes and i've read that's essentially everything there is to read on Jefferson. But the book that allowed me to to begin to understand Jefferson was yours. And I remember that Merrill Peterson, after spending, what, 15 or so years on his biography, in his preface, he said, in the end, after all that work, he said, I find Thomas Jefferson impenetrable. I remember that, yeah. And what an amazing admission from a great biographer and scholar and so but you you changed that so here, let me just give you my sense of this you i think because you didn't take jefferson too seriously you were enabled to see things that people who take him too seriously can't and so as you know dumas malone felt that jefferson could do no wrong uh, i think people were in a reverence mode Towards Jefferson, then of course now they're in a um, in a critical mode. What I would uh, edit in your comment is seriously. I took him seriously. He's a major figure. He is one of the single most important figures in American history. But I wasn't a Jeffersonian myself. That is to say, I wasn't writing from within Jefferson's mentality. I was writing from outside Jefferson's mentality. And everybody else up till then, almost everybody was writing from inside the camp. I was writing from outside the camp. I began with the assumption that like Jefferson was a flawed human being like me. And, um, and understanding the flaws was as important as understanding all the greatness. Yes. And so that's exactly where I want to begin here, Joe. So there's a paradox in Jefferson. You know, he's a liberty loving slaveholder. He's publicly frugal and privately bankrupt. Uh, he's a an Anglophobe who nevertheless um, believes that Locke, Bacon, and Newton are the three greatest men. He likes American Indians but helps to dispossess them. Uh, He believes that he's above the fray, but he turns out to have Machiavellian capacities when he needs them and so on. It's a long, long train of paradoxes, and everybody who writes about Jefferson has to try to come to terms with what I would call the Jefferson problem. And here's here's one way you do. I'm, I'm quoting from your page 88. Meanwhile, there were capsules or compartments inside Jefferson's mind or soul that were being constructed at this time to keep incompatible thoughts from encountering one another. In sum, the considerable diplomatic experience Jefferson acquired during his years in France was accompanied by what we might call a diplomacy of the interior regions. That's that's brilliant. Explain what you mean. There were things inside Jefferson. Jefferson had dual tracks inside him that didn't cross over each other and communicate with each other. And that the way in which that materialized for me as a researcher and writer was when you get to the Jefferson papers during the time when he is in France, 
all of a sudden there seem to be two people. There's one person who's writing letters back to Virginia and to his friends and colleagues back there. And there's another person writing to people in France who are about to witness the coming of the French Revolution. And they aren't the same person. They have different persona, different styles and very different messages. And he wants to keep them separate. Um, If he tells back in Virginia, he's telling people that while slavery is wrong, there's not much we can do about it. While in France, he's saying it obviously has to end. And like, how do those two people coexist? Um, It's one of the reasons why Jefferson only published one book in his entire lifetime. That was Notes on the State of Virginia, and he didn't even want that published. It was published without his permission because he preferred to target his audience with letters in which different views could could coexist because you're going to say one thing to Lafayette and another thing to Madison. And it was that experience as a researcher that clued me into um, – a more psychological insight into Jefferson. But let me also say that while I've read Freud and I've read Jung and I'm reasonably well-informed in some of those areas, I don't want to try to do clinical psychology. I don't want to fall into that language. I don't want to psychoanalyze Jefferson in some, some professional sense there. I want to be more commonsensical about it and to see the way in which his In this case, his letters demonstrate that there are different persona floating around inside Jefferson. And they, while they materialize first in France, you can really see it in the 1790s when his duplicities in terms of telling Washington one thing and then to someone else suggesting that that Washington is senile and probably shouldn't be president. How does he do that? And then he'll pass a lie detector test when confronted with it. He said, oh, I don't think I did that. So where does that Jefferson come from? And in in the letters, you begin to see it in the 1780s. Gentlemen, we need to take a just a short break from this conversation, but we'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation about all things Jefferson and American history. This week, we're speaking with the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson, and the noted author, Professor Joseph Ellis. And Clay, did you want to continue that line of questioning? I do. So I want to make a proposition. I want to ask a question. I, I too, don't want to psychoanalyze Jefferson, but I do want to ask you a question. So... At some point, fairly early on in his life, he began to create this wall, wall that separated different expressions of his being and kept them from communicating too much with each other. First is the question, if he had bored a hole between the wall and the two parts of his being had had to speak to each other, what would the result have been? You know, Would it have paralyzed him? Would it have made him stand down from some of his idealism? He, he, he does not have what I would call an integrated soul, uh, but that might be the source of some of his great uh, productivity, his capacity to go on in the face of the lie that was at the center of his life. Yeah, lie is a harsh term, and, and yet it's not totally wrong. I mean, here's a guy who, in his early years, is one of the most eloquent spokesman for the view that the values of the American Revolution are fundamentally incompatible with slavery. He is the spokesman for the view that the values we are fighting for in this war for our independence, which we're going to win eventually, are incompatible with slavery. And the reasons are clear that the, you know, that slavery is a vestige of the feudal past. It's the age of, you know, the dark ages. And we are exiting the cave into the bright sunlight of the new enlightened world. And in that enlightened world, slavery is a total anachronism. And he tries to put language about that in the Declaration of Independence, and the delegates in the Continental Congress delete it. 
it's one of the most garbled paragraphs he ever wrote, but it's, you know, it, it tends, it tries to blame slavery on George and the slave trade on George the third. And if you think about it, boy, that sounds like a great idea because since we're blaming George the third for everything else, we might as well throw slavery into the indictment. Um, and if we do, that means in the founding document of the United States, we've got a clear statement that slavery is incompatible with the values of the Republic. Uh, he later on also is the first person to argue that every slave owner in Virginia should be allowed to free his slaves if he wishes, and that succeeds. He's also in the Continental Congress, or what becomes the Confederation Congress, he proposes that all incoming states, all of the new territories, must come in to the Union without slavery and uh, with a statement that slavery is not possible inside those new territories from states. It loses by one vote. He's also the author of, of the provision that prohibits slavery in the Northwest Territory, all the land north of the Ohio River to the Mississippi. And that passes. And in Notes on the State of Virginia, in the final edition of that, he proposes that all slaves born after 1800 will automatically be freed at maturity. So he sees the victory of the American War for Independence as itself a statement, an abolitionist emancipation statement. And nobody else is saying that with the degree of clarity that he is. After that, however, he begins to, to step away from that. And here we get to the contradiction. I mean, there doesn't seem to be any connection in Jefferson's thinking between this highly abstract notion that slavery is incompatible with the values of the revolution and the fact that he's living at Monticello with, at various times, 100 to 200 slaves. That contradiction never occurs to him. There, he makes no effort to free his slaves. And so the guy who is the spokesman for the most eloquent modern statement about human equality in world history is also on record as believing that blacks and whites cannot live together in the same society. The central contradiction in American history, and Jefferson straddles it. He is the most eloquent spokesman for human equality, and he is outspoken in his belief that we cannot become a multiracial society. So what happened, Joe? So, I mean, the usual view is that uh, his youthful um, uh, idealism and passion on this subject butted up against political reality back in Virginia, and he got bruised, and his fingers were burned in a couple of political initiatives, and at some point he realized, I'm just not going to get that done. We'll postpone this to some time when this will kind of magically happen. Is that your view? Sort of. I mean, I think that that's true, that he knows that if he wants to have a career in politics in Virginia, he's got to back off that position because it's a fatal position inside the old dominion. But I think it's more, it's deeper than that for Jefferson. Jefferson is extremely uncomfortable in arguments. He wants nature to be harmonious and he believes it is. And that argument, and here he's the exact opposite of Adams. Adams thinks that argument's the highest form of uh, conversation. Jefferson can't stay. It's discordant sounds. It's like he's really uncomfortable in a dinner party where people are, are not agreeing. And if, to, to lead on this issue of slavery in Virginia is to be in a constant argument. And he just can't do it. He just is not psychologically and mentally put together in a way to do that. All right. Let me shift the subject then to something where he is, at least on paper, quite willing to be bold and even radical. So during the the French Revolution, Jefferson begins to write a series of letters to Madison and others. <clears throat> and maybe the most extraordinary of these letters is to his protege, William Short. Um, right. Jefferson's back in the United States by now. Short is still in France. Short is a beloved uh, uh, surrogate son for Jefferson. And he writes to Jefferson bemoaning the the wild violence and excesses and bloodshed of the reign of terror. And as you know, Jefferson writes back the famous Adam and Eve letter, Adam and in Eve which he letter, says, right. if there were one Adam and one Eve alive in every nation and alive free, that, you know, so that he has this sort of 1950s post-atomic view that there would be a single couple left over after the terror. And if they were free human beings, 
we could start over and we could get it right next time. Mm-hmm. What fuels that kind of wild, radical Jefferson? It is. I mean, it's. I mean, if that letter were published, it would have been devastating for him because it, it essentially says the death of hundreds of thousands, maybe millions, in the French wars is justified if if two people survive. It, Mao had a similar idea. The revolution is justified despite the casualties. Lenin had the same view. It's a it's a radical idea. I'm not saying that Jefferson is a Maoist or Leninist. He's writing this from back in Monticello, or maybe it's in New York. Yeah. If he were there, I don't know what he would have said, but it's always, he's distant from, you know, Short is describing heads rolling down the street, heads of friends of his who have just been killed on the guillotine. And it's the distancing from the violence itself that allows him to adopt that kind of uh, above it all uh, view. He does a similar thing with regard to something much less violent, but still violent, the Shays Rebellion. And he he says, you know, that the trees of liberty are, must, must periodically be refreshed by the blood of martyrs and victims. And Abigail writes him and says, yeah, you wouldn't be saying that if you were in Western Massachusetts and you were one of the people they were coming to kill. Um, he's removed. He floats. When Burns was making the film, we discussed uh, – Clay, remember, he has all these scenes of clouds over uh, and fog over Monticello. And I remember thinking and saying to, to Ken, you know, why are we putting all these clouds? And he said, with Jefferson, the clouds are the thing. He sort of floats above this and um, creates a, a universe or a, men, a world for himself. And if you think about Monticello, Monticello is a world, you know, up there on the mountain above it all that, that doesn't connect to the... Um, the reality of, in this case, the French Revolution. But doesn't it doesn't it strike you, in, and this includes Thomas Paine, that it's it's remarkable, even astonishing, that a man who was capable of such radical sentiment could be a major player and b- could become the president of the United States. As you say, these letters were not leaked publicly, but that radical streak in Jefferson marks him off as different from the other founders, most of whom were relatively cautious people who wanted a conservative revolution. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, you're asking a complicated question, about, you know, why he gets elected in 1800. And, and I, I, I don't know how to get at this in a way that's really easily accessible, but, um, Remember, when he was campaigning, he was accused by the people in the Federalist Party of all the radical things that we've just described. And Hamilton said he was an anarchist. Um, John Marshall said he was a terrorist. Um, uh, but he he could win the votes because um, the southern states all voted for him. And one of the reasons they voted for him is because his limited view of federal power meant that slavery was not going to be touched. So he ends up being a, a you know a candidate of the Southern aristocracy or the Southern plantocracy, and that's why he wins. Another reason he wins is the three fifths clause in the declar in the Constitution that essentially gives electoral votes uh, more electoral votes to Southern states, um, and he's the leader of the emerging party, the Republican Party, and it's not the Democratic Republican Party. You'll see that in all the textbooks. That's wrong. It's that's not what they call themselves. They call themselves the Republican Party, and that that party is the emerging party. It's the party of of ordinary Americans, but also the party of the Southern planter class. And but I think that that if you read the crit, uh, the there are a lot of critics of Jefferson in the 1790s um, who cite the very things you're talking about. This guy is a radical. He's crazy. And, um, and so it wasn't, it wasn't obscured, but he, he somehow rose above it. But that's one part of the question. The other part of the question is, where does this radical streak come from? You said he sees as if from above, and you pointed to the metaphor of Monticello. It's as if he's looking down at the earth from Jupiter or from 58,000 feet, and he's comfortable with the level of mayhem in the pursuit of liberty that people like John Adams just found flabbergasting. It's true, but in, and, and, and it is higher altitude. He does view things from a very high altitude, and yet that's part of his success. I mean, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Well, what does that mean? Just men? Um, 
and and what do you mean by equal? And so he's able to cast in language ideas that all different constituencies can read in different ways. Um, but instead of thinking of him as levitating above Monticello at 10,000 feet, I think you should think of him in his study by himself with a pen in his hand. And that he thinks that crafting the language in on that parchment with an ink is reality. And that and it and it becomes reality for a lot of Americans and over the years. But that it's like he kept a very precise account of the cost, for example, of building the University of Virginia, all these very specific figures, except they were all wrong. And he was overrunning the budget by hundreds of thousands of dollars. But he thought he controlled it because he controlled the account. He didn't. I mean, he, he controlled the language on the page. So it's not just a sort of a spirit up there in some angelic way above the clouds. It's a writer at the desk confusing the control he has over language with the control he has over reality. But that's that's one of the things that I puzzle over all the time, Joe. So here's this dreamer, this articulator of a vision of America. In your book, you say uh, he derives it from the Whig tradition and there wasn't really any truth value in it and the whole Anglo-Saxon myth of the hundreds and the ward republics and so on, that he's He's, he's really an imaginative poet dreaming an imaginative Virgilian America. And it wasn't, it wasn't true then, and it certainly hasn't been true since. And yet he had some kind of a grip. He, he some, was able to inspire. He, he was able to galvanize hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, to want to sign on at some level to this vision. I just find that really perplexing. Well, I think that no less a person and a mind and a poet than Abraham Lincoln very much valued Jefferson and appreciated what he had done. And, and, um, and really, it's Lincoln that makes the declaration, the kind of American promise that, that it becomes, um, and the American creed, but that what Lincoln sees and that Jefferson himself created is a set of ideals that are unachievable on this earth, but that are noble and that we should strive for. And we're never going to get there completely. It's the heavenly city on earth. But that embracing them as ideals and as things to strive for as a people is our noblest incentive. And in that sense, Lincoln uses the language of the Declaration to justify in the Gettysburg Address the, uh, the end of slavery as the goal of the war. And the women that gather um, at uh, Seneca Falls use the language to justify their claim for the vote. And Martin Luther King at the Lincoln Memorial uses the language to argue that that the, those words mean not just the end of slavery, but the end of racial uh, discrimination. So that the words are uh, abstract and, and idealistic, but they also are extremely compelling to a people that really does want to get as close to that heavenly city as possible. But here's a question uh, that sort of relates to your more recent thinking about the founders. Does that dream, that idealism about America as a kind of secular, shining city on the hill, this Virgilian agrarian paradise, does that dream do us more good or ill? Because sometimes I get the sense that America's always self-disappointed because we can never live up to the dream. And, and in many respects, we're, Hamilton was right, we're, and Adams too, we're just a nation like other nations doing what nations do. Is what what's the what? How does that dream percolate in our in our in our deep self criticism of ourselves as a people? Well, I think that that it can create a situation in which I mean, in the in the racial situation we face now, for example, I think that no white candidate for the Democratic Party 
presidency since Lyndon Johnson has ever won a majority of the white vote. And what we're facing is a situation with the current president in which the race card is being played straight up. Now, to what extent do you want to side with Martin Luther King and the spirit of Jefferson or the other side here? And that, I mean, and I think that, that while you can be disappointed that we still remain an imperfect society and and the, the admission of racial minorities has not reached the level of equality that, that the ideal would suggest it should, if you believe we're moving along a path that is, that is aiming to get there, there will be setbacks. There will be moments when we fall back, and we're in one such moment. But if you know that, that the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice, to quote King, that, and you're, we're all still pursuing the Jefferson ideal, and instead of interpreting the setbacks as permanent, interpret them as temporary and know where history is headed. Um, and it's headed towards a society that is more perfect than, than the one we have now. You're listening to a conversation with Professor Joseph Ellis about his book, American Sphinx, The Character of Thomas Jefferson. We're going to take a short break, but we'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to this special edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. I'm Clay Jenkins and talking with the great Joseph Ellis um, somewhere in the hills of Vermont. It's, it's almost like the late great. Yeah, there you go. But, uh, <laughs> enjoyed our conversation thus far. I hope we're not getting too reified. Talk about Jefferson being reified. But it, um, pull me back to the 18th century whenever I get off into a, into a cloud bank in the 21st century. That's exactly what I intend to do. We're looking at American Sphinx, the character of Thomas Jefferson. Um, an extraordinary book. If you haven't read it, I urge everyone to do so. I believe that it cracks the nut of Jefferson better than any book previously written on this subject, and that all subsequent treatments of Jefferson uh, owe a debt of gratitude to American Sphinx. I, I do think, however, that in some ways, Joe, by um, by um, demythologizing Jefferson to a certain degree in this book, you open the door to a lot of snarky biographers and historians who have been saying really awful things about our man. Oh, yeah, and, and I don't, you know, I think that, I mean, in some ways, I began my work on the founding era with Adams, and my goal there, and it, it has carried through with the book on Jefferson, was to say, look, it's time to put away childish things. When you're very young, you think your parents are perfect, and then you go through a phase later in adolescence when you think they're they're horrible, and eventually you mature and you can come to see them as imperfect creatures like you, but nevertheless impressive people and value them and love them. And the same thing is with the whole founding era. All new nations need mythical heroes for reasons that are, again, uh, only clinical psychologists can explain. But they do, and we created them in, for a hundred years. That you know they were that, and then they became just the opposite. You know that these are the people that are you know they're, they're imperfect, and and in some circles of academe, you know, that means like the founders are the deadest, whitest males in American history. What did they give us? Well, they gave us imperialism, racism, Indian removal, um, sexism, patriarchy. And there's this swoonish swing to that end. That's childish, too, it seems to me. And um, Adams is the perfect guy to do if you want to make the point that they're great but imperfect because his imperfections are quite clear. And he tells you about them. Jefferson, to some extent, wants to conceal his. But I want to recover them both uh, and, and all the founders in, and say that this is the greatest generation in American political history in terms of creativity. Jefferson is one of the most creative. Adams is, is also worthy in that category. But that we have to control our expectations here. If you're looking for, for, for perfection, you're not going to find it in this world. 
And if you want to do your politically correct isometric exercises against the founders in order to justify your own political and ideological perspective, please don't come around me, okay? That's not what we're doing here. And if you want to come to terms with the re real historic forces moving American history, perfection is not in the cards. And that's true, certainly, with Jefferson. Let me turn back to uh, Jefferson's time in Paris, another key element in your book, American Sphinx. As you know, um, and both of us are fascinated by this one, Jefferson wrote a letter to Madison uh, during the run-up to the French Revolution in which he said, the earth belongs to the living, not the dead. And in this letter, he said, if that's true, that the earth belongs to the living and not the dead, then the dead have no rights. Means that a constitution can't last more than a certain number of years. Even a positive law or a national debt can't pass one generation to the next because that would be to impair the freedom and the sovereignty of the next generation. And then in his typical way, he goes into statistics and says maybe 19 years is about the right time for each generation and we should tear up the Constitution and start fresh and cancel the national debt and so on. And he sends this letter uh, to James Madison, and Madison is horrified and writes a brilliant refutation of the letter, which, uh, which is actually uh, much more interesting in some respects than the letter itself. But what do you think of that? Obviously, it's not, Madison realized it's not practical, but what do you think of that as a as a as a way of thinking about civilization um, that was born in the in the extraordinary and sometimes radical mind of Jefferson. The brilliant side of it needs to be featured, though, because his specific context. He's writing this in France, and the French are about ready to have a revolution, or it's just starting because of the debt that's built up over the preceding decades that forces the king uh, to call the states general, and that opens Pandora's box. So he's keenly aware of the role that debt plays. Personally, he's not aware of it, but he's himself getting more and more in debt. It's a way of saying that the debt that accrues from preceding generations it causes enormous problems in, for future generations. On the other hand, as Madison in his response makes clear, and here you're Madison, you've just got through spending your fullest energy to create this thing called the Constitution. And Jefferson is telling you, we need to redo this in 19 years. And of course, that's from Madison's point of view, just loony. But I think that he also is recognizing that the Constitution itself must be a living document and constantly being modified and adjusted to science and to the new insights into human beings and to the world itself that science provides so that it's crazy, but it's brilliant. Uh, only a really brilliant guy could do this, but a brilliant guy who's living in the categories that he creates without connecting them to the realities of the world as it exists at the time. Yes, indeed. But let me give you a couple of examples. You said, you know, the Jefferson believes that you must have a living constitution. Um, that that that, and he wrote writes another letter much later to Samuel Kirchhoff saying we may as well require a man to wear the coat that fitted him as a child. Yeah, I mean, if you're an originalist in in uh, legal scholarship, this is an, this is heresy because Jefferson saying that all constitutions are living documents that have to constantly be amended and even redone. I mean, I think most of the founders, if you if you gather them together, look at us now and say. Why have you kept this crazy thing called the Electoral College, for God's sakes? We never really believed in that in the first place. It was a compromised position. Jefferson is saying that the Constitution is an inherently living document. And in viewing it at any moment in time, you're looking at it from your point of view, and it, it will be inevitable to you bring the values of your time to that discussion. Um, and to, to pretend that you're capable of... of, uh, of Total impartiality is crazy. So a couple of things. You mentioned the Electoral College. Think of the other areas in which we're perplexed and flummoxed by um, echoes of the Constitution that, we, that, that have long since really ceased to work for us. And so the Electoral College is one. The Second Amendment was clearly written with another sort of weapons technology in mind. The Impeachment Clause and the Emoluments Clause. The War Powers that wars must begin in the House of Representatives – 
you know, in some sense, a Jeff- if Jefferson were here, he would say, you're trying to govern yourself in the 21st century using an 18th century instrument, and it locks you into a paralysis that gives you one constitutional crisis after the next, because inevitably, in your time, you're going to need a stronger executive, and inevitably, you're going to have to move towards popular votes and elections. And so, isn't he right that, that we have created a reified document that causes as many problems as it fixes. And if you take him at his word in that letter about uh, generational sovereignty, that we need to have a con- another constitutional convention. Uh, we need to get together and rewrite write the whole thing. Amendments will be good enough for a while, but now every once in a while you got to go back and look at the whole thing. The trouble with that is, of course, if you try to do a constitutional convention in the current America, it's going to be a cacophony. Uh, we're, you know, at the time he's writing, there are three to three to four million Americans living on the Atlantic coast. There's 330 million Americans spread across an entire continent now. A diverse population. Property doesn't, you, you know, you don't have to have property to vote. Women can vote, and it's a it's a multiracial society in a way that he would have never been able to imagine. But that that the answer is clear. Yeah, we just redo the Constitution. But try to do that now, and you'll have absolute chaos. And the reason it worked when it did is because 55 white guys got together in total secrecy and without anybody knowing what they were doing, did what they thought was right. So, Joe, I've I've thought about that. So I want to ask you about the critical reception of your book, American Sphinx. We'll wait for a minute on that. But to start with, let's go to Jefferson's retirement. So, so I find something pretty sad about these years. Um, his his world is kind of crumbling. Monticello is physically in disrepair. It's never been finished. His debt is starting to eat him alive. At one point, he actually has to petition the legislature of Virginia to allow him to have a lottery to try to save himself from complete economic collapse. Uh, his grandchildren are getting married. Not all of those marriages are happy. His son-in-law, Thomas Mann Randolph, is having mental difficulties and, and bouts of serious depression and violence. It doesn't look like Jefferson's idyllic world of the agrarian. It looks more like the beginning of Gone with the Wind. How does he how, how does he maintain his Jeffersonian optimism, or does he, in the face of the kind of collapse of everything that he had worked for? Well, you know, there's that Maybe you've got the, the quotation at your fingertips, but you know the, one of the last things he he writes he, he, and is when he's asked to come to the celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Declaration in Washington at D.C. and he can't come because he's not well. Um, in fact, he's near death. But and he writes the letter that you know that says you know the the, the principles that we established are you know going to dominate the world all eyes are opening or opening to the rights of man yeah, yeah and um i think he's in denial about his debt he doesn't really understand how much in debt he is um uh and um he's the rough equivalent of about 10 million dollars in debt um uh i think you're, that the disappointing thing about him in his latter years is he's 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 only communicating with other Virginians and reading only the Virginia and Richmond newspapers. He's hardening, and he's, um, he's and he his position at the time is really a you know you know if when if when the Civil War comes he's on the side of the Confederacy, um, and he doesn't read the future uh, as well as Adams does and as well as Washington did earlier. Um, he, he, I, mean, I think even Merrill Peterson, who you appreciate, you know, really looks upon those those latter years as uh, disappointing years. But I think that he himself has this buoyancy that always will allow him to float a little above it all. And um, and you know, if you he doesn't he doesn't have to see it when the slaves are now he's in the ground when the slaves at Mount Vernon are sold down the river. Monticello, his only yeah. surviving daughter becomes a ward of the state um, and because she's impoverished. Um, he doesn't have to face that. Um, he, and I, 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 I think that, again, his two-sidedness is such that 
um, and he's got the University of Virginia to look at from his window, uh, a creation that is really an important architectural and educational institution. Um, so I, I don't think he died this in despair. I think he died um, in um, in denial. It's it's hard to figure out exactly what was the center of Jefferson's uh, soul and his, his way of seeing. You see that kind of resilience, that optimism, that forward-looking, that capacity to look from 38,000 feet or from Monticello. But he has Madison to try to ground him in the real world during those late years. He's got John Adams who's writing. And Adams is, you know, we usually say Adams was sporting for a fight, but he's being pretty careful with the sage of Monticello. And he's not saying you're on the wrong side of history. He could. He could be saying that, but he doesn't. They both know they're writing to us. That is, those letters are going to survive. And that he wants, I mean, I don't think that Thomas Jefferson believed that he was going to heaven or hell. I think he believed he was going into the ground. He was a deist. Um, but he believed in something called secular immortality, um, living on in the memory of subsequent generations. And God knows, he'd come and look at the Jefferson Memorial and say, and look, I like that. Yes. Um, there is no Adams Memorial. <laughs> um, and I think that, that uh, both of them, Adams and Jefferson, and that marvelous correspondence at the end, and those, that is a marvelous correspondence, I think we both agree on that, um, are um, founders who represent the two sides of the American Revolution, uh, the North and South Poles of the American Revolution, says Benjamin Rush, and, and showing us that, that, that the American Revolution is only a whole when both Jefferson and Madison are together and uh, in the friendship. Um, uh, and in that sense, um, that the, their belief that they're going to live forever turns out to be true, especially for Jefferson. Um, and in some sense, we're complicitous as the recipients of that, uh, of that image of Jefferson in his, in his idealism. All right. So, so Joe, let me ask one last question. Uh, quickly, what was the critical reception of this book? How did the, the historical world of, of Jefferson scholars and others respond to uh, the American Sphinx? The American Sphinx was reasonably well reviewed. Um, the, um, the the scholarly world broke into two sides in the sense that um, that the the Jefferson defenders were a little upset by it, although nobody at Monticello uh, told me I couldn't come visit. Um, <laughs> um, uh, and that. Um, but that the profession was moving in a totally different direction in, in terms of social history and interest in women, African Americans, and Native Americans. And so, in some sense, instead of engaging it, they simply ignored it. Um, we're not interested in him. We're interested in Sally Hemings. We're interested in the slave population there. Um, we're interested in Jefferson's role in Indian removal, but that that um, the profession, um, the scholarly profession, thought that it was um, kind of an anachronism. Joe, in our next conversation, I propose that we move from Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States, to the first president, and we look at your book, His Excellency. Does that work for you? Oh, yeah, and it's a real contrast there, obviously. Um, we, I look forward to that because we're going to be looking moving from an extreme idealist to an extreme realist. We're talking with Dr. Joseph Ellis, the author of a number of books, uh, one of my favorite, American Sphinx, the character of Thomas Jefferson. You've been listening to a special edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. We'll come back in a couple of weeks for our next conversation with Joseph Ellis. Stay tuned next week for another exciting edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826.
and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any show for a $12 donation, please call 701-575-0727. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bach Cello Suite No. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program, Through the Eyes of Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson.